there is a fine line with logging of not making your life completely about YouTube because you could. We don't film everything. I'll say the camera is probably almost with us like 90% of the yeah. time. So we always have the camera, but we try to keep things as organic as we possibly can. I'm excited because I'm actually a fan of good, simple living. That's right. I am. I'm a huge RV fan. I'm a huge off grid fan. And somehow on a, on, you know, a, a 11 PM watching YouTube, your channel scrolled across my YouTube feed. And I was so intrigued. It was when you guys first moved to your farm. So I want to introduce to you guys, uh, Melissa and Jeremy from Good Simple Living. I'm so excited to have you guys on the podcast today. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. So one of the reasons that I got in touch with you and wanted you guys to be on the show is because you are doing all the things that we teach here at Think Media. I don't even know if you knew who Think Media was or what we, we do here. Okay, you did. Good. That makes me happy. I should have asked that prior to. Um, but you're doing all the things. And, I and we have a lot of our audience who wants to start vlogging, but they don't really understand like how to do it. And you guys have become massively successful. I believe you'll hit a million subscribers with in the next year. You guys are making a full-time living doing YouTube and you're just sharing your life through vlogging. So we're going to dive into that today. We're going to go through your five tips. But first, I need to know though, Melissa, Jeremy, how did you even get started in this YouTube world? I'd love for people to know a little bit about your past and what your YouTube channel is currently about. Well, I started the channel, I guess, what, three, four, four years ago. And I the actually- The official start was way before that, but well, as far as devoting ourselves to it. Yeah. So we actually devoted ourselves to it about two and a half years ago. But I started the channel four years ago because I was selling vegetables and chicken eggs and stuff out of my yard. <laughs> and I wanted people to feel a connection to their food. So I just started it as a gardening channel and as like a backyard meat channel of like raising chickens or rabbits to, uh, for sustainability. And then I wanted people that came and bought kale for me to see their kale be planted and watch it grow because I thought that it would help them feel like for those that couldn't garden that they were gardening along with us and then they would come get that food and it was more of just a community thing like in my small local community and I only had like a handful of people watching it but then I planted uh, or I planted a uh, posted a video about rabbit and then I just walked away from it I didn't even check on it for six months and then when I went back and logged into YouTube, I had like 10,000 subscribers and the video had a million views. And I was like, what, what happened? So then I just started to feed the channel after that. Amazing. So you get a viral video about rabbits, you know, <laughs> yeah. and people think, oh, I've got to figure this whole thing out. And you're like, actually, I just started making content around what I was doing. Now yeah. you, Jeremy, you already had a career. And then how did you become a YouTuber? Um, honestly, ironically enough, when Melissa started all this, it was without my knowledge. Um, I was a full-time police officer at the time. And when she finally threw me into the fact that, hey, I started a YouTube channel, I kind of rolled my eyes and scoffed at it, thinking that it wasn't uh, a good use of our time. And uh, like she said, come to find out, we checked it randomly one day. We had a bunch of views on there. Our channel was not monetized or anything like that. And uh, so from then on, I kind of saw the potential in it and said, hey, you know, yeah, maybe this is a, a worthwhile endeavor because we kind of poured ourselves into it at that point. Yeah, it's, it's been such a cool journey because you guys actually basically sold everything in one state, moved on to this giant plot of land in gorgeous country of, I won't say where, unless you guys, do you guys say where it is? Yeah, it's okay, North yeah, right. okay. Um, I just didn't know if I knew that just from doing massive research on you guys, or if you actually do tell people that, um, but you guys moved out to Idaho and you started building a house. I mean, by yourselves, but with other contractors, but you started building your life in Idaho. Talk about like how you two became a part of that journey as that whole thing took place. Well, kind of like you said, when we moved here, we didn't have anything. We didn't have any infrastructure set up. We were actually living out of a camp trailer at the time. We slowly moved that trailer into a barn that we had built here on the property and then uh, took on the task of building out the living space, which we are in currently. Um, that was a long project, required a lot of us. And along the way, we were just kind of documenting and showing what it is that we were having to do for ourselves to to make life here on this land possible. Yeah, but as far as YouTube went, um, in order to move out into the middle of nowhere and start building a house, which was seven days a week building, we had to come up with a way of funding it and funding our lives and 
providing for our children because we have four kids as well. So it's not like it's just us and we can eat top ramen and live in a tent. We have four kids. And so we had to come up with a way of funding it. So I said, you know what, let's quit our jobs and let's be all in on YouTube and it's going to work. We're going to make it work and we're going to grind and get better because we weren't very good at filming. I was terrible at editing. <laughs> you know, I didn't know anything. I had never done anything like that. I mean, if you watch our original videos, they're they're pretty rough. I mean, they look like somebody who's pointing a camera at stuff and I, I feel my feet and just weird things. And so I'm like, I'm going to get better. And every single video, I'm going to try to get a little better and a little better. And I'm going to get better with the shots and things. So it was just an all in thing, like, like sink or swim. And we couldn't sink because we had kids. So we painted ourselves into a corner and had to make it work. Said make it happen. Yeah. I think if you're half in and half out, like I was in Washington, it's just so hard to grow that way because you've got work and other obligations and you're not devoted to YouTube and to the art of making a good video and that whole, it's just hard to grow that way. At least with the way we do things. Right. It is possible. I think it just, it frees you up, like she said, to, to really pour yourself into what it is yeah. that you're doing when you have more time yeah. for yourself throughout the day. It's hard to quit your job and just say, okay, we're going to be video creators now. <laughs> so, but, I mean, that's what we did, but I'm in no way advocating other people to go. <laughs> do that. It's so incredible. I, I'm not advocating that at, as either, except <laughs> that I think that you guys, you, you do what we call burn the boats. You just burn the boats. Yes, and you said, yes, there actually yes. is no going back. Yes, we right. are marking ourselves as video content creators. We're going to figure out how to make this work. And I think having that mentality of it not being a hobby, but it actually being a career, a sustainable yeah. income for your family. I think mm -hmm. uh, from seeing uh, you guys progress over the last couple of years, that actually to me was a pivotal point where where you started to actually see like, what are we doing that can make income? We're going to have a conversation about how you guys are full-time content creators in just a bit on the second part of this uh, interview. But I've got to know, you know, when you decided to go all in, what were some of the fears and insecurities about putting your life out on camera? Yeah. I'd say the biggest fear was failure um, and taking on this tremendous risk and letting ourselves and more importantly, our children down um, and our extended family. It, uh, <laughs> Proving them right. <laughs> it, was a, it was a massive, massive risk doing what we did. Um, I think that was my biggest fear personally, especially yeah. as, as the kind of breadwinner of of our family. Yeah, because, yeah, I, mean, I think a lot of the pressure was on him because he's the one that quit the full-time career. Um, and it was kind of like, if this doesn't work out, it plays out publicly. Right. Like, not only for our family and friends to see, but for any for anyone to see, like, these people went out there and they tried this and they sunk and they had to, you know, return with their tails between their legs. And that's that was a fear. There's insecurity in that. It's a very vulnerable position when you put yourself online and have things play out publicly, like you mentioned. Yeah. So, a mm -hmm. major, major fear of ours coming into it. Yeah. And then privacy and normalcy for our kids. So, like, originally, you didn't see the kids very much in the videos because we didn't want to just change everything about their lives and shove a camera in their face. And even now, they're not really on unless they choose to be. Mm -hmm. And some of them really like to be on camera and some of them don't. So, when they come out and they want to be on camera, we film them. But... We don't like if they're upset or they're crying or they're sick. And you know, we've had situations where we've ended up in the emergency room for stitches. And it would have been so easy to shove a camera in his face, make it the thumbnail, get a million views. But we've made the decision a long time ago that we were never going to use them in that way. So there's a there's a thin line with family blogging. Yeah, really, really good. I, I actually really appreciate that you guys honor your children that way um, because I, I actually think it benefits the storyline. You know, the vlog isn't about your kids or the the whole content isn't just about your kids, which I think is, is a mistake that a lot of family vloggers fall into, whereas your guys is to me as a viewer really is about this journey of building this um, farm, building this, you know, uh, ranch. What are you guys calling it? Is it a farm? Is it a ranch? What are we building here? 
It's kind of more of a hobby farm for us. Okay. It's a pretty small operation. Yeah, yeah. But it's that idea that that actually is the focal point. And then you've got right. characters around it, which is the right. family. So um, let's jump into some of your tips because people want to become vloggers. That's a huge thing. Uh, you know, Casey Neistat was someone who really established that uh, mm -hmm. uh, several years ago. And so many people want to do that. And actually here at Think Media, it's not the first thing we tell people to do because as you guys have figured this out, it's hard, right? It's hard to tell stories. It's hard to continue this on a very regular basis. But you guys have really... I think unlocked the code for how to do vlogging right. And so, uh, Jeremy, the first tip you had is using what you've got. Now let's talk about what equipment did you start with and what equipment do you guys have now? And how has that changed when you talk about like, just use what you have and get started? Yeah. It's just a matter of not making excuses and, uh, you know, trying to find solutions for every problem. So in the very beginning, we had a horrible DSLR camera that we used with awful, awful raw audio that was really difficult to make out. Uh, we were taking that really poor quality footage, dumping it into Windows Movie Maker, I believe is the name of the program. And that's what we were using for all of our very rough editing once again. So um, rather than being, hey, you know, I don't have the proper camera that is recommended that I'm seeing everywhere online. Uh, we use that very basic DSLR because that's what we had. And from there, we transitioned to just our smartphones. We didn't have high quality smartphones. I think the first one that we started using was an S10, Samsung S10, yeah. which again was an improvement, uh, both visually with footage and audio wise, but it still was it pretty was rough. rough. Yeah. Um, we then transitioned to Wondershare Filmora was a program that we are still now using to this day yeah. for all of our video editing. And it's just kind of grown and evolved over time. And rather than you know getting hung up on the fact that I don't have this microphone, I don't have this camera. We just always embraced and used whatever it is that we had access to. Yeah, and your skill set is what your skill set is. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying, and I think people can become very easily overwhelmed by taking a bunch of film courses, watching this fancy editing, getting fancy editing software that's extremely overwhelming. I mean, I looked at one of them and it had all these different lines. There was like five audio lines and I was like, ah, <laughs> it's so, like, I don't know how to do this. And I just instantly shut down. Mm -hmm. And instead of just starting with something that made sense, something that was easy, user friendly, and then as you perfect that or as you become comfortable with that, add one thing. That's my thing. Like every video, add one thing. Mm. <laughs> Get good at that. Then add one more thing. Yeah, really good. And I, I appreciate too, even, you know, you guys, you don't have a studio set up. It's not like you've got like the best lighting. The, I mean, you're literally just vlogging your life inside, yeah. outside, all weather conditions, inside yeah. with dust, outside with, you know, so it's Wind. this idea of just what do you already have and how can you tell a story with it? And um, that actually goes into the second tip, which is to be your authentic self. Melissa, has that been something that you've really had to work on over the years of, of doing this? And how have you applied that to this successful vlog that you guys have? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of a hard transition. I was a teacher back in the day. And so I kind of have that that teacher how to ness about me. And so all of my videos before were how to's, like how to prune a tomato plant, how to process a chicken, <laughs> how to cook a rabbit. So, and it was all like, so da 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 da. And I had to get off of that how to mindset, mindset mm -hmm. and just go back into just acting normal. And when you're talking to a camera, you're not, there's no person there. So mm -hmm. it's hard to be natural and just be yourself and. Yeah, it's easy to say, hey, be yourself, but being yourself and being yourself on camera are two entirely different things. And kind of like Melissa mentioned, it was the same thing for me. I was a police officer for 14 years. So I had this way of kind of carrying myself and speaking. And I still do it. Even when I watch myself on, on video, now, I'm like, why are you explaining things the way you're explaining them? But um, yeah, it's different. And it's a skill, again, that evolves along the way. And it comes with constant refinement and trying to improve and get better at what it is that we're doing and devoting ourselves to. Yeah, and you do just become more comfortable as it goes. But I think being authentic goes a really long way. And once you can establish even the smallest level of comfort with being on camera, so long as you can also be yourself, I think that translates and comes across really well to viewers. Yeah, I've seen people, uh, Bill, they want to come across as like being very safe and family friendly and everything, but they necessarily, they, they aren't necessarily at home. And so then they create this character and then they have to maintain this character and it's so much better to just like we'll crack dirty jokes and we'll do things that are inappropriate and stuff because that's how we act. Mm -hmm. Like if you come hang out with us, you come have a beer with us, we're going to say something inappropriate. And so we just figure, you know what, let's 
build our channel and our audience around people that are comfortable with who we actually are. And then we never have to pretend to be something else. Mm. I think that really authentically being the number two authentic self that comes across very authentically on your guys's channel. I feel like you express your values without expressing your values. You share your relationship without sharing your relationship. So I think that, um, you know, it comes with the practice. Like you said, Jeremy, being a police officer, this like a camera in your face now, it's kind of weird, right? But over time, as you do it more and more and you just kind of, you just kind of see that it's, um, it, that whatever you, however you normally are, uh, just be that on camera and it'll come through, right? It'll be, it'll be a part of that. Now, part yes. of that also is this idea, especially for vloggers, a lot of the advice out there is like build a storyline. And I think that that actually isn't good quality advice for vloggers, but I think that there's this idea that you should just be showing as you go. And I know that's tip number three. Um, and so Melissa talk about like, how do you guys build, um, you know, are you filming all day long and it's, you know, 17 hours of footage and you're cutting it down to 20 minutes. Are you seeing different moments to record? What does that look like as you show as you go? Um, so sometimes stuff will happen and it's like, let's record this. And then other times stuff's happening where I'm going, I should be recording this. But then there's that, that line between family and personal life. And so sometimes we're just like, no, you know, like Christmas morning, you guys aren't going to see Christmas morning because that's for us. And so there's a, there is a fine line with vlogging of, of not making your life completely about YouTube because you could, like mm -hmm. you could film everything and yes you're going to end up with this crazy blog you're not going to miss a single thing but at the same time you have to have real life and and so that's been a balance and i think again if it was just jeremy and i we wouldn't worry about it as much but being with the kids it's a huge concern with not filming absolutely everything yeah we don't film everything i'll say the camera is probably almost with us like 90 percent of the yeah. time so we always have the camera but we try to keep things as organic as we possibly can so we don't go into recording our newest video with um like specific shots in mind or we don't storyboard things out we just kind of take the camera out have a rough idea of what it is that we're trying to accomplish and we do our best in the moment um to keep things again organic yeah. and and capture them in a way um and with a, a style that we we like and we prefer yeah so there's challenges in that like if you do a lot of vloggers will do their thumbnail and their title before they even start recording and then they mm -hmm form the video around that we don't do that we actually just but then there are times when we're like do we even have a story here <laughs> like, you know is there does this even go together but it goes together in editing it always does but we've gone on vacations where we didn't storyboard and we didn't plan things or activities and then as we're leaving the vacation we're going did we even get a video yeah. and so so there's i think maybe a happy medium between the two and that's probably something that we're going to work on to get better at and we definitely don't have this all figured out. Are you ready to start or grow your YouTube channel? Do you feel stuck and need help connecting the dots? Join this free web class where you'll learn the step-by-step -step playbook for YouTube success. We've helped thousands of purpose-driven entrepreneurs just like you grow their influence with video. Register today for this exclusive training at thinkmasterclass.com. Yeah. And as you are showing, as you go, I notice that there's multiple camera angles a lot of times. Um, so is that, uh, something's happening and you're like, grab the camera, Jeremy, move it over here. Yeah. Or is it like, yeah. let's set up two cameras. What does that look like for you practically? That's, that's part of that style that we liked where we want to capture something, but we don't want to capture it from the same vantage point for, for the entirety of whatever it is that's unfolding. So oftentimes, especially when we're in the middle of like a build project, Melissa will literally shout at me if she has a camera in her hand stop <laughs> hold on one second and then she'll shuffle over somewhere just to capture it from a different angle and then she'll be like you know she'll cue me back in and say okay go ahead and i'll finish my cut or whatever it is i'm doing so we've gotten i feel like we've gotten pretty good with that workflow wise but yeah. yeah we use just a single camera so when you're seeing all those different angles that's because one of us is running around trying to capture it from different angles yeah 
That's so fun. Well, props to you guys, because I was like, what do you have like three? Do, are you employing your kids to be a part of no. this? Like, I mean, all the different angles. And I think that also, you know, we'll talk about um, uh, one of the other tips, but really to me that you guys are really great storytellers. And I've noticed too, um, that a lot of times you'll, when you say, oh, sometimes we don't feel like we have a video, you do voiceovers that I think really helps to draw the whole video together and really creates a story rather than it just being a bunch of different shots of you guys, you know, putting in the kitchen counters or whatever that looks like. So um, right. I think that's really cool to see that you're uh, even when you are showing as you go, you're still using a lot of different editing techniques um, along the way. Now, number, number four, your tip was actually don't watch other family vloggers or don't watch other people that are in your space now, but you do watch other YouTubers so that you're starting to see that there's these other options for how to be applying different storytelling techniques. Why do you think it's important as a vlogging tip to actually not watch your competitors? We take a tremendous amount of pride in, again, trying to be ourselves and do our own thing and carve out our own way. Um, I think when you watch others who kind of operate in the same niche that you do, you run the risk of having things kind of somewhat like infiltrate your mind and then you you tend to try to mimic somebody else rather than being yourself to get back to that whole point of trying to be your authentic self and, and, you know, being you all of the time that you're on camera. So, um, we, we come up with our own thoughts, our own ideas and try to implement them. And we, it's always the hope that that's what sets us apart from, you know, anyone else operating within the same space we are. Yeah. There's a lot of mimicking that goes on on YouTube. And I think that that's not the best way to, start a channel like if you're starting a channel don't copy another channel's name trying to get those immediate views because you'll always be viewed as a copy of that channel like so you should try to set yourself apart find what makes you unique and embrace that instead of just copying you know like oh that thumbnail is really cool let's let's do that exactly don't do that <laughs> come up with your own idea yeah. And one of the things you guys do while you're not following other people in your niche, you guys are integrated into the YouTube culture. So you're seeing other channels that are pulling things in. Um, and actually prior to this, we were talking about some of those channels and I just made a connection that, you know, one of those, uh, um, Ryan, who is a huge YouTuber, I'm actually seeing now in your content and his content, even how you guys angle certain things that I'm like, oh my gosh, that makes sense now. And how fast some of your edits are. Yeah. Um, so talk about just being a part of the YouTube culture and how you're pulling from other types of content. Yeah, I think I know, it's very important to know the space and be familiar with the platform and see, you know, what people respond favorably to or what we even uh, like and enjoy ourselves. So like with Ryan Trahan, he's a very quirky, kind of silly personality and, and we kind of are ourselves as well. So of course we're drawn to that. But yeah, as far as watching other people, and the things that they do or even learning about their creative process, I think is a huge part of actually doing YouTube for yourself. You kind of have, have to somewhat be a student of the game and have uh, some semblance or an idea of, you know, the things that that work well with an audience. I think it's really yeah. important. Yeah, I think there's a big difference between watching videos and, and seeing how they can tell a story without saying, okay, now we're going to do this and then do it. Yeah. Now we're going to do this and then do it. So we're trying to get better at that because that's completely how we came out the gate. We were like, now we're going to install this stovepipe. Do, 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 do. Now at the stovepipe it is. It like, and, and that's a hard thing to break out of. That's a natural thing to want to do. And so we're mm -hmm. trying to get better at telling the story through actions. And so we end up with a lot less talking and more organic, natural talking. And, yeah, I think making videos is a skill. And if there's anything to be drawn from someone else and watching the way that they, they do things or what their process is, there's there's a lot to be gleaned from others. So I think being a student of the game, yeah. again, is, is of the utmost importance. Yeah, like we had our kids take the Casey Neistat film course. It was an yeah. excellent course. And he talks all about storytelling and how to tell the story and how to, like, I love the, when he, something I've never been able to pull off when he's saying something and he says it in 10 different locations but it's one seamless sentence it is incredible and he talks about how he does that and how many times he records each word mm -hmm. and then he tries to put it all together in editing and i tried something like that once and it was not good <laughs> but i mean that, like when i see him do it i'm like oh that's so beautiful it's such it's something that i think a lot of viewers don't notice but creators notice it like wow that's incredible Very that you impressive. can do that inspiring yeah so yeah we watch a lot it, casey and i comes out with a new video where like 
display. You know, mm-hmm. we want to see everything we get. Yeah. yeah, you put on this new lens, right? It's like um, it's it's like before you used to watch YouTube and it was just entertaining and it was fun. You didn't really understand right. it. Then you become a player in the game and you're like, oh, did you see how they did that? Ooh, did, oh, did and I always yeah. think too, I'll yeah. be watching videos next to my husband and I'll be like, dang, that took a long time. He's like, can we just watch this video? I'm like, no, I want to honor that I understand <laughs> yeah. that whatever that shot was or that scene was, that yeah. took a lot of time to actually be a part of that. So I love that you guys are coming at YouTube uh, with that creator lens on yeah. as you're watching and seeing what other um, creators are doing. And then lastly, your tip, which is probably um, coming from a teacher heart as well, Melissa, is, you know, always try something new. And I think it's really, you know, inspirational to see that your vlogs when it, they first started are not what they are today. And really, we're going to get into more of how um, in the part two of how you guys have actually made this your living. This is how you're supporting your family. And this is your career now. Um, and so much more is going to come out of part two. But I would just love to hit on this. As a vlogger, why is it important to always be trying something new and experimenting as you're creating content? Yeah. Um, well, so I always tell people always try something new, but always try one thing, Mm -hmm. one thing and per video. And that's so you don't become overwhelmed because if you become overwhelmed, you you shut down and you're far more likely to quit if it's not fun and, and you feel like you're failing or you feel like I can't do this. So it's like start a video and then I'll say like, I just started doing this, you know, the zoom in thing and the zoom out thing where you barely notice it. I started that I don't know, six months ago or something, but I started with one video, like this video, I'm going to do a couple zoom ins. I think I did like two and he's like, Ooh, fancy. And now it's like, if, if you watch one of our videos, it, there's so many, there's like 90 of them now. Mm-hmm. Cause now I'm comfortable with that. I understand like approach leaving when to use it. When when to to use it. Yeah, exactly. When it's too much, <laughs> you don't want to be like, Ooh. so, you know, just learning something. And then once you have that, try something else, try a new transition in the next video, but never stop using the new skill. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you have this whole collection of skills for editing that you just learned one at a time instead of trying to do all of them as a new blogger. Mm -hmm. So, and then every video, just try to make it a little bit better and a little bit better. We always want to watch a video three months later and hate it. Mm. So like, that was bad. Like, oh, that was so bad. Look at what we did three months ago. You should always be your own worst critic. And I feel like you should always be kind of unhappy with the videos you made in the past. Mm-hmm. And that way, you know, you're progressing. Mm-hmm. I love that tip. I, I I think that's really critical for any content creator to be showing progress, to be trying right. new things, to be experimenting. Um, I just got off of a meeting right before this where we were like, the podcast needs to change because we were noticing that our analytics were telling us that people only like these types of videos. And so I think it's really important too to, to analyze, you know, what's working, what's not working and how can you be incorporating new things? So, um, well, I'm really excited. What is my last question for this uh, segment is, is, um, or for, for this episode is um, someone is listening right now and you know they've picked up their camera a few times. They're still kind of nervous. They're trying to figure out this whole YouTube thing. They want to make this something that is a reality for them and their family. They want to either pay off their student loans. They want to be able to you know move states and build a house. They want to. They really want to figure out how to make YouTube their career. Um, what would be your leaving advice for a brand new content creator who wants to pick up blogging? and have that be the direction that they go? I would say get started, get going, jump in, um, do it and realize that you may not be great at it in the beginning. It's a constant process of uh, refinement, um, a lot of self-reflection and self-motivation, just trying to improve over time. You may not be great out the gate, but really the only way to get better is to start doing it. Right, yeah, get started and apply yourself to it, apply yourself to learning and getting better and don't become discouraged because it's so so slow in the beginning (laughs) and then it's a snowball effect like the bigger it gets the faster it grows but in the beginning it's slow i mean when we first got monetized you don't get a payout till you get a hundred dollars and it would take us three or four months to get a payout which meant we were making 25 dollars a month we used to joke that we'd make dozens of dollars doing dozens of dollars and that's on for two years Mm -hmm. (laughs) so if you give up you're never going to get there you have to just keep working but you have to keep improving you can't become complacent and say well this is how my videos are and this is all I'm capable of then you're not going to grow mm-hmm. 
So, so good. Well, thank you guys for being on this episode. The next episode, we're going to talk about all about how you guys became full-time content creators, how you're using YouTube to support your family. And I've got some questions around how you guys are specifically doing brand deals in your videos that are helping to uh, monetize um, the content that you're creating. So I'm excited for part two in just a few moments. <laughs>